I asked ChatGPT to generate a cat with colorful parakeet feathers, and this is what it gave me. But watch what happens when I show it to two of the world's best image classifiers. Microsoft's classic ResNet calls it a macaw, and Google's Vision Transformer classified it as an Egyptian cat. Same image, two different labels. And it all comes down to model architecture. ResNet is a convolutional neural network, or CNN. It was specifically designed to process images. On the other hand, the VIT is based on the transformer, which was originally designed for language processing. So how can a text-inspired model be better at image classification than a model that was specifically designed for images? Convolutional neural networks go all the way back to 1989 when Yann Lecun built one of the first systems that could recognize handwritten zip codes. His core idea was to train a neural network to uncover edges, textures, and shapes. And for the next 25 years, it became a blueprint for computer vision. By the early 2010s, CNNs were undisputed. And then, somehow, Transformers took over. In the rest of the video, we'll see why that happened. The core building block of a CNN is the convolution operator, which actually predates machine learning. You can find it in math or image processing when blurring or sharpening an image. To get into the weeds of convolution, I will downsample the original image just so that we can observe every pixel. The specific effect of convolution is determined by a small matrix with real values. This is called a filter or kernel, and I'll use these two terms interchangeably. The filter slides across the image such that its center visits every single pixel, and every filter shift produces a single output pixel. Now let's zoom in at this particular pixel position in the original image. To compute the corresponding output pixel, we take the dot product between the kernel and the pixels it covers. Each pixel is a three-valued vector with one value per color channel, red, green, and blue. It's easy to see that this particular kernel averages across the nine-pixel neighborhood that it covers. So the output pixel is a uniform mix of its neighbors leading to a blurring effect. You can see the eyes of the cat fading away in the output image. In a conventional image processor, the brush size determines the kernel size and the intensity controls the kernel values. So to blur an image, you need a single convolution operation. Actually, let me be more specific. What you truly need is a single 2D kernel that gets replicated three times and applied independently to each color channel. Deep learning generalizes this idea. Instead of three separate yet identical 2D kernels, it learns a single 3D kernel that can mix information across input channels. The output is what we call a 2D feature map. It basically has a single channel. A convolutional layer simply stacks multiple kernels. With n kernels, you get n feature maps, or n output channels. A convolutional neural network is a series of such convolutional layers intermixed with pooling layers. These two types of layers play complementary roles. Convolutional layers increase the number of channels, from 3 to 4, 8, and beyond. You can think of channels as different ways of analyzing an image. RGB corresponds to the three color perspectives. As layers get deeper, the points of view increase in number and get more abstract. Pooling layers decrease the height and width of the representation. Max pooling, for example, keeps only the highest valued pixel in each small neighborhood. This kind of compression encourages abstraction. When detail is removed, only the important patterns survive. In our ResNet classifier, the very first convolutional layer has 64 kernels and therefore 64 outputs with different views of the cat. Somewhere in the middle of the network, this convolutional layer gives us 128 outputs, but a lot more coarse-grained. I explained CNNs and convolution in a lot of detail because I wanted to convince you that they're opinionated. 
They process images in a very specific way. Formally, that's known as inductive bias. And models with high inductive bias make strong assumptions about the nature of the input data, which limits the function space that they can explore during training. On the one hand, that's good because we're manually pruning out pathologically bad function spaces. But on the other, we might be unwantedly excluding the best function spaces as well. CNNs make three main assumptions. The first one is locality. Remember, a small kernel slides across the image combining nearby pixels. Within a single convolutional layer, a pixel can only influence its local neighborhood. This is equivalent to having a very narrow receptive field. One implication of locality is that CNNs often prioritize texture over the overall object structure. So when presented with something like this, CNNs perceive the texture of the macaw feathers as a stronger signal than the outline of the cat. In fact, if I manipulate the image and reduce the details around the feathers, the CNN will change the initial label from macaw to cat. The second assumption made by CNNs is translation invariance. It sounds very pretentious, but it's simple. Consider a kernel that detects eyes. When it slides over the entire image, it basically looks for the same visual element everywhere. This is a way of acknowledging that objects can be present at any location. And finally, the design of CNNs assumes images have a hierarchical structure. By stacking convolutional layers that gradually decrease the data resolution, CNNs start with local features and progressively combine them into complex abstract representations. In principle, we would expect this hierarchical design to nudge the label towards cat, but locality prevailed in this case. So CNNs have a strong inductive bias. The opposite force to bias is variance, which is just a technical term for freedom or expressivity. Compared to the CNN, Transformer makes a very different trade-off, much lower bias, much higher variance. Transformers owe their low bias to self-attention, their basic building block. You might already be familiar with it in the context of language, but let's see how it applies to images. Just like convolution, you can think of self-attention as a transformation of an image that operates in a conceptual space. For now, we'll apply self-attention at a pixel level. This is very intensive computationally, but we'll deal with that later. So say we're currently processing this pixel. According to established terminology, this is the query pixel. To process it, we'll take all the image pixels into account and we'll call them key pixels. And yes, the query pixel itself is also part of the keys. It plays a double role. If you're struggling with this terminology, remember that the transformer comes from Google, which is a search company. The image is like a database of pixels. And the query pixel is basically trying to retrieve relevant pixels from this imaginary database. When retrieving from a regular database, we would pick the top K most relevant keys. That's called hard retrieval. But self-attention does soft retrieval instead. It associates a weight or attention score to each key pixel, reflecting its relevance to the query pixel. So the output pixel is a weighted sum with the constraint that attention scores should be positive and sum up to one. The amount of attention that a query pixel should attribute to a key pixel K can be defined by a similarity measure in vector space, like a dot product. A simple trick to ensure the score is positive is to exponentiate it. And another trick to ensure the attention scores for a query pixel sum up to one is to normalize by their sum. This is also known as the softmax operation. What we have here is a complete definition for the output pixel, but it's fixed, it's not learned, just like the blurring kernel. In the context of a neural network, we'll generalize this operation by passing all pixel vectors through linear transformations. So we'll multiply them by learned matrices. The query pixel gets a query matrix, the key pixels share the same key matrix, and the output pixel gets a final value matrix. And that is self-attention, minus some constants that I'm emitting for brevity. 
When we compare convolution and self-attention side by side, one difference jumps out immediately. A convolutional layer has a strictly local receptive field. Each pixel can only interact with its neighbors. Self-attention has no such constraint. A pixel can look at any other pixel in the image in a single step. Now, CNNs do accumulate some long-range interactions through depth. As you stack layers and pull features, the effective receptive field grows. But that's an indirect multi-step path. It's not the same as the top left pixel directly attending to the bottom right pixel. So there's already an intuition here that self-attention is a more general, less biased operation. But we can make an even stronger statement. Attention is a superset of convolution. This paper shows that self-attention layers can and do learn to perform convolutional operations. They even formalize this in a theorem. A multi-head self-attention layer with n heads can express any convolutional layer of kernel size square root of n by square root of n. Let's unpack that. Multi-head attention just means we run the attention calculation multiple times in parallel, each time with different q, k, and v parameters. That gives the model multiple points of view on the same query pixel. One head might pay attention to the ears, and another one to the paws. What you see here are the heat maps indicating the strength of the attention scores. Now, why do we need n heads to reproduce a kernel of this size? Why couldn't a single head do it? After all, a single head could set all attention scores to zero except for the nine key pixels that would normally be covered by the convolutional kernel. And across those nine pixels, the attention pattern could simply emulate the kernel. But here's the catch. Attention scores depend on the image itself. They are computed through a dot product of query and key pixels. A convolution kernel, on the other hand, is fixed. Its weights don't change with the input. So a single attention head cannot guarantee the same score pattern across all images. To reconcile this, let's think of convolution as applying a weight based on a pixel's relative position. Offset minus 1 gets weight 0.3, offset plus 1 gets weight 0.1, and so on. We can mirror this idea in self-attention with a simple variable change. We'll index keys relative to the query and then add a relative positional encoding to tell the attention score how far each key is from the query. Our goal is to make the attention scores only dependent on this relative position, just like a convolutional kernel does. It turns out there exists a particular choice of Q and K that cancels out all image-dependent terms in the dot product and keeps only the relative position term. What's left is a one-hot pattern. Each head attends only to one relative position consistently across all images. I'm omitting the proof here, but you can find it in the paper. The single leap of faith that you need to make here is that such a choice of Q and K exists. Now, since one head can only attend to a single pixel, we need nine of them to implement a 3 by 3 convolutional kernel. And that's what the theorem claims. Its implication is that self-attention is not just less biased than convolution, it's a strict superset. It can implement convolution and much more. And this behavior isn't just theoretical. Here's a trained digit recognition model with six layers and nine heads each. Look at layer one. The query pixel is in the center and these orange-red pixels are the positions each head attends to. At least four of the heads show sharp, localized patterns that closely mimic a convolutional kernel. The nature of self-attention compared to convolution is just one reason why transformers replaced CNNs in the world of computer vision. But there are two more forces that are equally important. The first one is timing. Transformers arrived in 2017 when NVIDIA's Volta architecture introduced tensor cores and Google began deploying its first TPU fleet. These accelerators excel at massive parallel matrix multiplications, and transformers are designed to take full advantage of that parallelism. 
all query tokens, or in this case, query pixels, can be processed simultaneously. CNNs can parallelize convolution across kernels, but the information flow through the network remains bottlenecked by locality. A pixel influences only its 3x3 three three neighborhood. That neighborhood influences its neighbors in the next layer, and so on. Long-range communication requires dozens of layers, and more compute doesn't shorten that chain, it just makes each hop faster. The second force that propelled transformers is multimodality. Modern models increasingly need to process text, images, audio, and video within a single system. CNNs have a strong inductive bias tailored to images, and that bias doesn't generalize well. Attempts to use CNNs for text never matched transformers' performance. Self-attention, on the other hand, applies naturally across all modalities. A single transformer architecture can treat all of them in a unified way. So the core idea is that attention can subsume convolution. That, paired with an increase in computational power and our interest in multimodality, is what helped the transformer take over computer vision. Now, there's one can that I've been kicking down the road, which is the fact that applying self-attention at a raw pixel level is extremely expensive and impractical. In the next video, we'll talk about how modern architectures like the Vision Transformer or Diffusion Transformer make self-attention tractable on real-world images. For now, I'll leave you with an unexpected joke from ChatGPT that I got while researching for this video.